Reno's Bank Club was the town's first large casino, opening at 239 North Center Street on March 30, 1931. Gaming wasn't new to Reno, but it was finally legal. Of Nevada's other vices, legal prostitution, quickie divorce, and quality booze during the nation's prohibition of alcohol, were the top three. Newspapers and magazines around the country called Reno the nation's harlot and a place hell-bent on destruction filled with dens of iniquity and rooms full of wanton lust. It was great publicity. Tourism skyrocketed. The bank club inside the Golden Hotel was small by today's standards, but offered a spiffed-up gaming floor with a hazard game, two 21 tables, two craps, and two roulette. The floors were hardwood, no carpets, but the bar was beautifully handmade and drew plenty of customers who weren't really allowed to drink alcohol. Perhaps it was a Keno game, the poker, or that one slot machine. Maybe it was the hookers who were required to saunter around the bar after the shift at the 100-room stockade two blocks away. Nevada's richest man, George Wingfield, owned the building, and before anyone had heard of skimming, he rented space to casino operators and took a weekly cut under the table of 15 to 20 percent. The bank club's owner-operators, Bill Graham and James McKay, learned the gaming business from Nick Abelman in Tonopah, Nevada. In the early 20s, they came to Reno and opened illegal clubs at Wingfield's request. When gaming was legalized in 31, they were already experienced, and the bank club moved its tables upstairs to the main floor from the basement. The all-male crew of dealers got a pay raise to $10 per day. Pit bosses drew $12. That was heady money back then. United Groceries offered Wheaties, corn on the cob, a pound of prunes, or Old Dutch cleanser for just a nickel each. Lamb, pork, and pot roast were 11 cents per pound. Gas at 12 cents a gallon. In the casino, a drink was a nickel. So was a fine cigar. Graham was a huge boxing fan. So he and McKay promoted fights and opened a casino at the Reno Racetrack with former heavyweight champion Jack Dempsey. When an outdoor pavilion was finished, they held the Max Bear Paulino Uzakunduno fight in 1931 and the Max Bear Kingfish Levinsky fight in 32. Between the two prize fights, Graham had a more serious fight on his hands. At the same time Amelia Earhart was flying across Wyoming to Salt Lake City, gearing up for the first ever solo transatlantic flight, Reno was still a cowboy town, and Bill Graham was a relic of days gone by. He carried a holstered Old West revolver. On June 4th, Graham played poker at the Haymarket, just down Douglas Alley from the bank club. Alcohol was illegal due to prohibition, and the joint was busted by government agents just five days earlier. But tonight, good Canadian whiskey flowed unabated. Still, Palace Club craps dealer Blackie McCracken wasn't happy. Eventually, Graham told the mouthy drunk to shut the hell up. When he didn't, Graham decked him with a shot to the mouth. Barman Howard Moffat spread wood chips on the floor to sop up the blood after Blackie crawled away. His nose may have been broken. Twenty minutes later, McCracken burst back into the bar and opened fire with his 45 caliber Army Automatic. The first shot went astray. The second grazed Graham's arm. The third shot never happened because his gun jammed. In between those shots, Graham do, drew his 38 caliber Colt revolver and shot the wall behind Blackie twice. As McCracken's booze-addled brain registered that his gun was jammed, Graham calmly took a third shot. It pierced Blackie's chest. He died quickly thereafter, and Barman Moffat spread more wood chips. Graham was absolved of any crime. As Reno grew, so did the bank club. Its reputation as a place to launder illegal funds spread to crooks like Lester Gillis, a.k.a. George Nelson. After a long string of bank robberies, fights, scuffles with the police, and several murders, the newspaper dubbed the man Babyface Nelson. While on the lam, friends sent him to Reno and Bill Graham. Graham took a liking to the killer and hired him as a driver and bodyguard, going so far as to find him a house just a block away from his own. Nelson returned the favor when Graham and McKay went on trial for mail fraud. But that's another story. In the meantime, Nelson stayed in Reno 
and saw other crooks like Alvin Carpus and Ma Barker's gang come into town with satchels of cash from their bank robberies and kidnapping escapades. Graham and McKay laundered the money for them at their clubs, and not in a surreptitious way. The crooks just gave the cash to Graham, and he paid them a percentage a few days later, usually taking 20% for his trouble. Meanwhile, the crooks played a few games, maybe some Keno, and went to the movies. Prior to the Midwest crooks joining Reno's crooks, Graham and McKay had cashier Roy Frisch set up a safety deposit box for them under the name of Mr. William Morrissey at George Wingfield's bank in the Riverside Hotel. See how intertwined everything was? The box was used regularly, especially when Graham and McKay profited from stock swindling escapades with local con artists and rich visitors who got taken in horse race scams. But eventually the pair got indicted for mail fraud since big losers paid with shares of stock in legit companies and mailed them back to Reno. After a trial that ended in a hung jury, Baby Pettis Nelson did his thing to get them acquitted. He succeeded with his task, but after his death, the two were still tried and eventually sent to prison in 1939. In 1935, Jack Sullivan, a.k.a. John Scarlett, a professional boxer from nearby Goldfield and Ely, worked for Graham and McKay. While dealing with a questionable bet at a faro game one evening, Sullivan forced a man out the door of the casino and across the street where he beat him to death. After sitting in his cell for nearly an hour, Sullivan got released on the new belief that the corpse in question had most likely drowned in the puddle along the road. The police considered it a likely scenario after Graham sent an envelope of cash to the police since the victim had a broken arm and pushed in face that may have made it quite difficult to move out of the puddle. There was no coroner's inquest. Sullivan was a free man. Tex Hall, who Sullivan brought from Ely, Nevada to work at the bank club, was as tough as his friend, but not as lucky with prison time. He managed special events for Bill Graham, worked at the Calneva, and was jailed for six months in 1935 for conspiracy to harbor George Babyface Nelson. Also in 1935, while Graham was standing on the corner of Commercial Row and Virginia Street with a local bartender, policeman Jack Farrell, and Bill Kane, a San Francisco nightclub owner, the conversation died down. So Kane leaned toward Graham and said, you know, Black Tony owes me $2,000. Kane was hoping that Graham would cover Tony Parmagini's loan, but instead Graham gave him the old one too, a punch to the stomach and then an uppercut to the face that knocked out several of Kane's teeth. Black Tony was head of the Pacific Coast Narcotics Group. Graham was a money launderer. They were pals. And while the policeman and Graham walked away from Kane, the bartender helped him to his feet. Kane refused to press charges later after first saying Graham had beaten him and yelled that he was a stoolie and a policeman lover. Imagine that. Charges dropped. While Graham and McKay were spending time in Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary, Jack Sullivan ran the bank club in Reno and acquired one-third ownership. Up at Lake Tahoe, Bones Remmer ran the County of Lodge and also acquired one-third ownership. And with some crafty ways of doing his taxes, he lived the high life for a decade. Then he lost his balance, had a great fall, just like Humpty Dumpty, and the casino and property had to be sold to Sanford Adler to pay existing property taxes and liens. Calling Remmer the property's owner didn't help, and his personal tax problems led to a long legal fight and eventually jail. Also up at the lake, in a cabin at the Calneva, stayed James McKay's wife, a beautiful and lusty 37-year-old who died on the porch of her cabin months before Mr. McKay was paroled. Gossip said she was lonely and had a regular visitor. An autopsy failed to find the cause of death. There were no charges. Back in Reno, the bank club continued to grind out good profits while making the paper on a regular basis. In 1944, local con man James Lanigan put the move on an owner of the townhouse casino. When they met again at the bank's bar, Lanigan told Jack Blackman he better pay up right then and there. Blackman didn't reply, only snickered. So Lanigan punched him hard enough to break his nose and knock him down. This time, Blackman did reply. 
and from a prone position drew his pistol and emptied the chambers. Six shots rang out, three hit Lanigan. He had the good graces to stagger out the door before he died. Graham and McKay missed Lanigan's trial and acquittal, but returned from prison in 1945. Although he had served only six years of their nine-year sentence, Nevada Senator Pat McCarran convinced President Truman to award them full pardons. By that time, Bill Hare had been in town for several years and opened numerous clubs. After hours, he liked to get faced at the bank club bar. One of the bartenders got tired of serving him and not getting tipped, so he stole a slot machine from Hare's blackout bar around the corner. Jack Sullivan apologized to Hare and said they didn't need the police to get involved. Nonetheless, Hare filed a police report anyway. The bartender went to jail. Bill Hare went to other bars to get smashed because he was no longer welcome at the bank club. Ever. In 1946, George Wingfield sold the Golden Hotel for $1.5 million to local businessmen. But Graham and McKay's 20-year lease remained intact. There were questions raised the following year when Bugsy Siegel visited friends, including Reno Hotel owners, at the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco. The FBI was watching, and while Siegel provided the race wire for all bookies in Reno, they most notably commented that while in Reno, Graham provided a hooker for ex-boxer Jack Dempsey. Way to go, FBI. In 1950, Sullivan tried to sell his interest in the bank club to Doc Stratcher, a major East Coast booklegger and who had worked with Bugsy and Meyer Lansky. The deal got rejected by the Gaming Commission. So Graham McKay bought out his share, and afterwards, Stature got a nice percentage of the Sands Casino in Las Vegas. The Golden Hotel housed the Bank Club Casino at 239 North Center Street, but also the address of 227 North Center Street, where the Brunswick Club operated. It was a bar and poker room from 1931 until 1946, when the new hotel owners leased the space, then 219 North Center, to the managing director of the Golden Hotel for his Golden Gulch Casino. The hotel and gulch were sold to Thomas Hull, who owned the El Rancho Vegas along the Las Vegas Strip. But Reno's centralized and small casino area reminded him too much of downtown Las Vegas with no growth possibilities. He sold out to Frank Hofus in 1952. Jim McKay sold his shares to Graham in 52, shortly after the partners received a promissory note from Hofus for $3.5 million. And while money had been moving to Chicago from hidden interests for years, at least according to the Chicago Crime Commission, nobody from the Chicago outfit was licensed until 1954, when John Drew picked up 25% of the now Golden Bank Casino. He was literally Chicago's golden boy. In his new position, he immediately hired Lester Killer Cruz as a pit boss. The Gaming Commission objected to Cruz. He had a very unsavory history, but in the end, they let the Chicago outfit mobster stay. The following year, Graham and Drew sold their interest to James and Bill Tomerlin. Although the Tomerlin brothers made good money, their dreams went up in flames on April 3, 1962. The hotel and casino had been previously restored, refurbished, changed, outfitted. It looked great. They had big sh dining rooms. They had big shows going. But that was all over. The hotel and casino were completely destroyed. The Tarmelins sold the steaming pile of concrete and girders to Bill Hera, who built a hotel on the site in 1969. This picture shows what happens to old dice, like old casinos. They eventually wither and disintegrate. If you want to know more about Reno casinos, read Mob City Reno, available at Amazon. And thanks again for watching Nevada Gaming History's Bank Club Reno on YouTube.